Okay, so you're going to high school, mm-hmm. and at 15, you start Those are taking... the most formative years of my life in high yeah. school, yes. And at 15, you started taking astronomy courses at the Hayden Planetarium. No, earlier than that. Earlier than that. Oh, yeah, when I was okay. 12. 12. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, when, uh, when I was in sixth grade, which in that era was in elementary school, mm-hmm. um, a teacher noted that all my book reports had astronomy themes and that I had this energy in class that by most measures would just be considered disruptive. Huh. Okay, I passed notes and I, I wasn't purposefully disruptive. It was just a, a bubbling of energy that, you know, what is a good student? A good student is someone who never disrupts the class, obeys every command of the teacher, and that's considered a good student. And so by that measure, I was not a good student. And all my report cards, I have them all, said, Neil needs to show, exercise more um, a discipline for his academics and less social involvement is in order. So there was this combination of, of uh, disapproval of my personality, basically. And requ- so one of the teachers said, maybe he needs another project after school. So she showed me this this ad for courses that were being taught at the Hayden Planetarium. These courses for adults, actually. And so, so I began basically when I was 12. And uh, and I took classes through middle school. And last one was early high school. So about 15 was probably the last one that I took. Yeah. Okay. And was it at that point that you kind of fell in love with astronomy? No, no, no. Earlier. <laughs> Earlier. Okay. So when I was nine, all right, when I'm nine years old, a family trip to my local planetarium, the Hayden Planetarium, and I was starstruck. Literally. Literally and figuratively starstruck. Uh, I mean, it was so bad or so good that there I am, you know, in these big cozy chairs, which usually adults fall asleep in. If you put an adult in a big cushy chair that leans back in the daytime and turn out the lights. They're all asleep, but the kids are all just paying attention. So we there was a family trip and I'm there and I'm looking at all these stars and I just don't believe it because I've seen the night sky from the Bronx. Mm. So it didn't match my life experience. I know how many night stars there are in the night sky. There's like eight or 10, yeah. all right? So I thought it was a hoax at first, but it was a beautiful hoax, yeah. only later, traveling Western Pennsylvania, back to the Caribbean, and I pay attention to the actual sky. Later, I'd go to mountaintops. Um, to this day, to say how warped this is, to this day, when I look up at the splendor of the night sky in an unobstructed place, I say to myself, that reminds me of the Hayden Planetarium. Mm. <laughs> so that's, it's, 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 I guess, Art, it, it's reality imitating art. Well, yeah, I mean, it's because of light pollution, right? At the why, time, why especially. You can't, you can't see all the stars. I mean, I remember the first time I went to Egypt and we were like in a taxi going kind of cross country in Egypt and we pulled over and we looked up and it was like, oh my God, like I've never seen this many stars before. Right, three, three things contribute to that. So you're in desert likely right. if you're in Egypt. Yeah, so, in so there aren't any clouds and even... When there are no clouds, often there's a humidity level that'll still interfere. Low humidity, no clouds, which are two correlated facts. Yep. So you had that. Yep. And I bet it was a night when there wasn't a moon. I bet. Possibly, yeah. Okay. The moon is not always out all times at night. Yeah. So that combination, it struck you. It found you. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. was amazing. Like I still remember that night to this day, whatever, 20-something years later. And you know something? Billions of people... For thousands of years, that's the only sky they ever saw. <laughs> yeah. There's no light Before pollution. electricity. You know, exactly, yeah. exactly. And, and that's relatively recent. Mm-hmm. C- cities weren't electrified more than 110 years ago or so. So just in the last century have we lost track of the night sky. And when I was growing up, not only was there light pollution, but there's also air pollution. Yeah. I remember because apartment buildings would burn their own garbage – in the incinerator chute. And so the ash would ascend in the hot air, um, you know, hot air rises, so it carries the ash with it. As the air cools upon exiting the smokestacks, the, the chimneys, the ash would then descend. 
So I'd walk to school and I'd have to hmm. brush the ash. Dirt off your shoulders. From my shoulders. Yes. That's how old I am. Okay. So you graduate high school. Yes. In 76. And you Bicentennial. Apply... I'm sorry? Bicentennial. Bicentennial. That's exactly. They made a big deal of that. I, yeah. I didn't really uh, care, but everybody else cared. The 200 so. year anniversary of, mm-hmm. of America. And I guess you apply to Cornell University. I applied to five colleges, including yeah, Cornell. Cornell was mm-hmm. one of them. Yes. And Carl Sagan got a hold of your application. Yes, mysteriously, but yes. And I can only conclude, or I can I infer, that because the application was so rich with reference to the universe, so I was in the astronomy club and I bought a, my telescope walking dogs, other people's dogs, and I did a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, from age 11 and 12 onward, that I think they must have sent him that application. Hmm. And since I hadn't already said yes, they thought he might help me say yes by inviting me to campus. So that's exactly what he did. So uh, Carl Sagan, you know, he was a major figure, but he wasn't famous yet because he hadn't done Cosmos yet. Well, he wasn't famous for as famous as... He wasn't as famous as he would become. Yeah, but he was famous. He was already famous. He had written best-selling books. Mm. He had been a guest many times on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. In fact, the the famous reference of him saying billions and billions, he never said that. You know who said that? Johnny Carson imitating him (laughs) with a comb-over wig, all right? So that was – so he already had very – significant public exposure before this. So I knew he was famous. Mm-hmm. And I got this letter from him, yes. But you, you didn't end up going to Cornell. No, I didn't end up going to Cornell. You went to Harvard. Went to Harvard, right. Okay. So now you're at Harvard. But don't you want to know why? <laughs> Why'd you go to Harvard? Why'd you turn down Carl Sagan? <laughs> don't you want to know why? For something? No. Okay. <laughs> so, so I'm deciding what schools to go to. And at the time, I subscribed to Scientific American. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite parts of that magazine, by the way, at the time, all the articles are written by active research scientists. And there's a part called About the Authors. And for every author, there is where they grew up, what college they went to, where they got their master's, where they got their PhD, and where they were serving on the faculty. And so I collected my multiple years of Scientific Americans, found all the physics and astronomy articles, and then I made a spreadsheet by hand. (laughs) A handmade spreadsheet of the colleges I was accepted to and how many degrees and faculty were either obtained at that institution or were they resident in such an institution. And I made this checklist. And Harvard was three or four times longer Hmm. than the next closest institution. And I said to myself, well, and I knew enough at the time, I'm 17, but I knew that if I go to an institution for one person, people change institutions. They can, he could be attracted somewhere else and then he's gone, but I went there for him. So where does that leave me? Hmm. And so what I wanted was the greatest range of options that, I could be immersed in. So even if my interests shifted, there'd still be some activity there serving that interest. So uh, at Harvard, I didn't know at the time, but I would later realize shortly thereafter, that the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory, the government astrophysics arm, believe it or not, the United States has a government-based astrophysics arm, was co-located with the Harvard College Observatory. And the combination of those two is what fed this list primarily. So I went there for that reason and only that reason. I didn't care about the ivy or the traditions or the fame or the whatever. I went there because I wanted I, I wanted the richest exposure to the universe that I could get. 